regard to the homosexual with the friends of Jesus here in Calcutta. Here are the wonderful Swedish fish. You should buy them. They come in many wonderful flavors, and they're really, really wonderful to eat. Four ninety nine. Is homosexuality a sin? This is the first thing to distinguish between the act itself and perhaps a tendency to be attracted of those of the same gender. Um, it's no sin to struggle with the temptations of homosexuality, but it is a sin to consent and act upon them, to think about them in a deliberate manner of lusting after an individual. And so we need to distinguish between struggling with this tendency and actually acting upon it. And so that's very important. And, and I even, I don't speak as people as, oh, he's homosexual or she's homosexual, because that, that idea identifies them by right. perhaps their weakness or right. by how they have so many other gifts and problems and this and that and that. They should be identified by their identity, which is a son of God and a daughter of God. That's who they are. There's so many other aspects to them. And when Mother Teresa was being interviewed, the media was asking about homosexuals and this and this and this in Calcutta. And she inter interrupted and she said, you know, I've just decided I don't like the word homosexual. And they, they were taken aback. And she said, from now on in the interview, you'll refer to them as the friends of Jesus. Go on. And they said, okay. Anyway, Mother, with regard to the homosexual, with the friends of Jesus here in Calcutta and the rest of the interview. <laughs> Beautiful. And that's the church's mindset that um, those who struggle with this are called to a life of chastity because, you know, a lot of the world struggles, well, well, if I have these desires and A, if I can be faithful to one person of the same gender my whole life and I freely will it and it's, it's not like we're having multiple partners or this or this, what's wrong with that? And what needs to be seen is that the sexual act must be total, it must be free, it must be fruitful, and it must be faithful. And so if you can give yourself totally in commitment to a person, be faithful to them, um, but you sort of take out that, that fruitfulness part, it would just like be saying, yeah, I'll be fruitful with you and I'll totally give myself to you, but I'm going to sleep with some other people also. You take out the faithfulness part. But all four of those elements need to be there for, for the gift of sex to reflect what God created it for. I was talking to a group of young people one time and one of the kids raised their hand and said, Father, why does the Catholic Church hate homosexuals? And I was taken aback for a moment and then said, no, you, you have it all wrong. The Holy Mother Church loves homosexual people as much as she loves heterosexual people. In fact, she loves all her children, everyone created in the image and likeness of God, as you're saying. And her message, though, is the same for the person who has the homosexual orientation, for the person who has the heterosexual orientation, that only the pure of heart will enter the kingdom of God, and that God does offer his grace and strength for everyone to be able to live this purity. We want to have compassion for the person who has that uh, sexual orientation, because maybe they didn't want it and they don't know how they got saddled with it necessarily. It's very kind of a complex uh, speculation as to how someone uh, discovers that they have that orientation. We want to have compassion for them and the church has infinite compassion for them and she doesn't hate them. She loves them enough to tell them the truth that you too must live by the uh, moral standards that Christ has, has established for us. We can't sell you a watered down version of the Catholic faith because you have this problem, but we can pledge that God will give you the grace if you make good use of the sacraments and prayer and everything that the heterosexual person has to make use of to remain chaste as well. Sins against chastity. There are, are, are loads of ways, you know, human beings can come up with all sorts of ways to do sin and all, against all sorts of virtues. but. Sins with ourself, impurity with ourself. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people, even the, the word, you know, we shy away from, but we can't because we need to be able to share the truth. But masturbation, mm -hmm. I mean, that's uh, when we take, Father, how do you describe? I mean, how do you? Well, you know what I'd say, Greg, even what, yeah, that's a very perceptive point that you bring out that even saying the word, there's already a sense of shame. You know, it's like the, which God gives that sense of shame with sins uh, approaching or, or um, purity or, or contravening or contradicting purity because he wants to protect the gift so that uh, he has placed pleasure in the use of the gift of human sexuality, but that pleasure can only rightfully be experienced by two people who are using the gift according to God's plan, uh, to bind, uh, bond people for life and to bring new life as a result of that. So in other words, again, we don't have a right to that pleasure. We can't say, well, it's my body, I can do with it what I want. No, the Gospels and the, and the New Testament says, no, you're not your own. You've been bought at the price of the blood of the Son of God. You know, you have to realize that you're not your own. You have to treat the body as a temple of the Holy Spirit. 
um, we don't have a right to that pleasure. And so it's disordered and, and it flies in the face of what a lot of pop psychology and you know, the common misunderstanding that, well, yeah, it's good, it's healthy, it's part of naturally growing up. Well, yeah, temptation and sin is a part of our fallen natural condition, so it is common, and we shouldn't lose heart at the face of experiencing the battle. But we don't want to then say, well, then it's right and justify it. We want to call upon God's grace and yeah. speak and live in the truth. Yeah, and there's a battlefield in every human heart between love and lust. But what, what masturbation does is the center of this sexual act becomes me instead of we. Instead of a gift of self, there is no gift at all. Uh, because the whole meaning of sexuality, which is babies and bonding, and neither takes place. No bonding, no babies uh, whatsoever. Uh, and so it reduces the gift. And, and if I cannot say no to sex, uh, what is my yes worth? If I can't say no to sex with myself and I can't lead myself to purity, how will I lead a bride there? How will I lead a family there? And if I'm struggling with this vice, addicted to it, you know, Christ's grace, the sacraments can help uh, overcome that completely. Um, but if I enter into marriage thinking, well, I, I'll just do this before marriage and when I get married, uh, everything's fine anyway and I won't have these temptations, you're not healing the disorder of lust. You're basically transferring that onto your wife because you've trained yourself that sexual desires, I need to be gratified. I have my needs and they must be met. Uh, whether by me, by pornography, internet, whatever it is, they need to be met. And that, what, that's essentially what a wife will be for. Uh, and this is cancer within a marriage. And so, uh, you know, let us train ourselves to overcome this vice for the sake of being able to give ourselves as a gift. If I cannot say no to sex, uh, what is my yes worth?